Welcome online family, we're glad you're here. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you won't miss out on any of our content. Also, head over to the App Store and download our TFBC app where you can check out all of our events. You can leave prayer requests for us. You can also follow our sermon notes as we give the message each week. Speaking of messages, we got a great one for you today. So let's dive right in. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. We continue in our study in the book of Romans, and we are about to make a, uh, a significant shift. want to greet each of you, especially those uh, watching online, and uh, hopefully you have your Bibles. As we get to the 12th chapter of Romans, uh, we find one of those therefores we've been talking about, and we'd always ask, what is it there for? And uh, certainly the first 11 chapters, Paul has laid out doctrine, if you will, how it is we can be saved. And uh, particularly he's taken the gospel to the Gentiles. And so remember his audience is going to be made up of both Jews and Gentiles. And as he is presenting this gospel, he's trying to anticipate and answer questions that are going to come up. And when he gets finished with chapter 11... He is ready then to make his powerful statement, therefore, based on all that's happened. And so I'll invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word as we look together at the first few verses of the 12th chapter of Romans. Paul begins, therefore, I urge you, and you might think beg or plead is the word used here. I urge you in very strong terms, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, think the first 11 chapters, in view of what he's just told you in chapters 1 to 11, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform uh, to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Think the Jews probably in the crowd that day needed to hear that a little bit as they were maybe looking down on the Gentiles around them. Do not think more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, though many... We form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophecy, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, and you may be seated. If I were to ask you the question, how many of you want to know what God's will is as you're facing maybe a challenging situation, a difficult situation, many times we would say, if I just knew what God's will was in this situation, if I I just knew God's will, and we have to be careful with that because when we arrive at this portion of Scripture, Paul is going to make it very clear what God's will is. In fact, I would suggest to you this is one of the places where I believe not only is it a hinge point for the book of Romans, I believe it's a hinge point for all of Scripture. (laughs) I literally believe the 12th chapter of Romans can serve as a hinge point to give us insight and understanding to the whole scope of Scripture. In the very beginning, we understand there was darkness, there was chaos. And God began to create. God reveals himself. He appears on the scene. God is a creator. He begins to speak. The spirit is present and creation responds and God calls forth creation. He said, let there be light and there was light. God is creating. And then if we go all the way to the end of 
the Bible and Revelation, we'll find God is creating yet again a new heaven and a new earth. And we get reminded that God is a God who is making all things new. How many of you know what it is to get up in the morning and, and feel a pain and say, oh, that's new. <laughs> and I don't mean that way. I don't mean. I'm just saying God is a God who's making all things new. And sometimes that can be, well, it can be difficult for us because we often struggle in those arenas. God is working to make all things new. Pastor Jeremy said last week, he referenced the, the day of judgment and how God would separate the lambs and the goats and the idea of, of, of judgment. I, I believe that's already to some degree happening. God is separating those who are responding to his word and becoming new creations who will then inhabit the new heaven and the new earth and those who are not responding to his word and therefore are not becoming a new creation and therefore being uh, dead in their sin. They're not experiencing the newness that God wants to call forth in our lives. In this passage of Scripture, we find Paul, inspired of the Spirit, opening up for us an understanding as to what it is God is doing and what it looks like for us to participate, to be a part of the kingdom of God. Now, how many of you remember the, uh, the old game Hokey Pokey? Anybody remember Hokey Pokey, right? <laughs> Hokey Pokey where you put your left, I see, or your right hand in and your right hand out and your right hand in the left hand in, left foot in. You remember all that? Yeah, and then, you, yeah, I see some of you. I, I used to be addicted to Hokey Pokey, but I turned myself around. So anyway, <laughs> but... But here's the thing, in that game of hokey pokey, if it goes on long enough, you finally get to a place where I put my whole self in. And that's really what Paul's talking about here. It's, it's a profound statement that Paul says, if you really understand the first 11 chapters and what God has done for us in Christ. The only response that one can give is to offer themselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. What's holy mean? Holy is just a good church word. It means set apart. If something's holy, it means it's set apart for God's purposes. We, this building is a building that may in some ways be like other buildings in town, but this building is viewed differently. It's a building that is set apart for the worship of God. It is set apart for God's purposes. Therefore, how we view this building and what we would do in this building may be different than how we would think of other buildings. Holy. So if we're to be holy and pleasing to God, it means we're to be set apart, different, and then we're to be pleasing. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we know if we're going to be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing, we're set apart and we're exercising faith. We're trusting God. And the language here is clearly language of Old Testament. It's the language that the Jewish people there would have resonated with, the sacrifice of the animals that were a part of their worship system. And Paul is now turning it around and he's saying, God doesn't want your sacrifice of animals. We know now Jesus the Messiah was the Lamb of God who, who paid that price. He was the sacrificial Lamb of God. Because of his sacrifice, our sins are forgiven. And Paul's introducing a new teaching. God's not looking for sacrifice He's looking for living sacrifices, people who understand what he's done for us and hear him speaking to us and calling forth that which is new, and therefore we become living sacrifices. Pastor Jeremy mentioned last week that the primary purpose for which we as humans are created 
is to glorify God and enjoy a relationship with Him. That's when you really sum it all down. Why are we here? What's our purpose? We are to glorify God. And Paul's saying here, the way we glorify God through worship is by becoming living sacrifices. He says, that is your true and proper worship. Now, remember, he's speaking into a culture in a time where they had all these religious things that they would do. And they would, I'm sure, much like today, would just kind of check some boxes off and say, these are things I do because I'm a religious person, and therefore this is my, uh, this is my worship here, and this is my worship here, and this is my worship. And not to say those things uh, aren't significant, aren't important, and don't matter. What he's simply cutting through is your true and proper worship is to become a living sacrifice set apart and exercising faith that is pleasing to God. So how is it then that we glorify God in this way? And I want to just share a little bit as we step into this passage. The first point is glorifying God is about becoming a living sacrifice. If we're going to glorify God and therefore do what we're created here to do, we must become a living sacrifice. Put another way, if we do not respond to the Word of God and become a new creation, We're simply like, if you can imagine anything back in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 that didn't change, right? It just, it stayed the same. It did not respond to the Word of God. It did not become new. Therefore, it is not part of God's kingdom, what God is calling forth. In order to be a part of what God is doing, we must become something new, a living sacrifice, Paul says it this way in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is that sense of becoming a new creation, Christ living in me. I remember as a young man... uh, receiving Christ as my Lord and Savior at the age of 12, not really understanding what that meant, but continuing to get into the Word and and read the Word and wanting to gain a better understanding of who God is and what God was trying to speak to me, what God was calling forth, and eventually out of that responded to a call in ministry, feeling as though God was saying, This is what I want to do with your life. And and as best I knew how to try to make myself available to say, then God, I, I want to be whoever you're calling me to be, whoever you've gifted me to be, whoever that you desire for me to be, that is my heart's desire to become that person. A sacrifice. What does it mean to become a living sacrifice? Well, if we think about a sacrifice, certainly in the Old Testament, they would would take an animal and it symbolized uh, the the, the faith and the the heart of the person. And that animal is sacrificed and and, and given to the Lord. And Paul's simply saying, and it was never the case that God wanted all these dead animals, so to speak. What God was looking for was the the response behind, the, the obedience, the faith of the person who's offering the sacrifice to understand the seriousness of sin, to understand the significance of what it means to sacrifice. And it was certainly a system that was set up to at some point point us to Christ and then beyond Christ to point us to this concept of becoming living sacrifices, that we give our life to God. The song we sang this morning, I, I surrender. This is where I lay it all down. I give it to you, God, and what do you want to call forth as a new creation in me? Paul would write to the Philippian church these words, Therefore, if any of you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, okay, so if Christ is going to dwell in us, if we're going to unite our life with Christ, He says, if there's any comfort from his love or any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility, 
value others above yourselves. Now, let me just ask you, if we were to live in that way and value others above ourselves, out of humility, would we look different and set apart from the world? Not looking to your own interest, but to the interests of others. Would that, would that cause us to look different? In your relationships with one another, had the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then he would go on to write, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. And then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. I think when we read that last verse, we can clearly acknowledge that we we definitely have the warped and crooked generation all around us. It seems like things are becoming more warped and crooked all the time. The question is, will we find that capacity as Christ dwells in us to begin to do what God's called us to do without grumbling and arguing so that we can become blameless and pure, children of God, holding out the words of life. Now, for this to happen, there has to be a change. We have to understand some of what it means to become a living sacrifice. As human beings, there's basically four aspects to us. One would be what we call our soul. In order to become a living sacrifice, first and foremost, your soul must be given to God. You must must begin by praying receiving Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that, that what we would understand as soul, the essence of who we are, has been given to Christ. He is Lord of our life. And then there's three aspects beyond the soul that we might refer to, body, mind, and will. Body, mind, and will. The first one he addresses here in this first part, the body. We are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. That's the physical bodies, that what we do. So today, for those who will be uh, participating, for example, in serving with the children's ministry and our family ministry to to families through the trunk or treat event, we are sacrificing some ways. We're offering our, our, our bodies, our cars, our trunks, and we're handing out candy. We are participating together to do something for the glory of God so that the name of Jesus Christ can be lifted up and we can have opportunity to to share or speak light into darkness, to encounter people that God loves, offering our bodies. This is the the part where where we serve in some capacity. We acknowledge all of us have been given a gift, a spiritual gift of some sort, and we are to offer our bodies physically in service to the Lord. That goes... Uh, hand in hand with the second part, and that is the mind. He says, if we're going to glorify God, it's about becoming a living sacrifice and being transformed by the renewing of our minds. Notice he says in verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The mind offered to God as we study his word, as we allow him to speak to us, we begin to experience God calling forth that which is new. Now, what is the pattern of this world? If we're going to think about not conforming to the pattern of this world, and uh, I don't know about you, but uh, my lovely wife has patterns. I was able to get one this morning. Uh, Yeah, huh, huh? Some of you younger ladies, uh, I'm sure, have no idea what this is, but this this is a pattern where you can actually uh, make clothes, right? Yeah, and uh, you take the pattern and, and uh, cut it out. Some of you ladies know, and you're saying, man, that's a lot of work there. And you'd actually make your own clothes. Uh, you can tell, but it's just the way I'm holding the pattern. I've done it a lot. Uh, 
But uh, here's even instructions how to do it. You can follow the pattern along and cut out the pattern. And one, one year, actually, I do remember Luann made an Easter dress for herself. And then she made an Easter dress for Rebecca. And then she made a matching necktie for me to match their dresses. And I just said, this has got to stop, you know. <laughs> that tie was worn one time. But anyway, a pattern, right? So you have a pattern that you cut something out and, and, and you, you have a pattern you're following. What is the pattern of this world? If we're not to conform to the pattern of this world, then let's think for a moment, what is the pattern of this world? May I suggest selfishness, right? Selfishness would be a big one. Thinking of self, everything goes through a, a, a filter of self. What do I get out of it? What, what you know, how is this going to benefit me? We, we, we tend to, as human beings, that's the pattern of this world. Selfish. Might attach to that kind of greed. I want as much as I can get. One of the realities of our world is many families stop speaking to one another right after a death. Why? Because of an argument over inheritance. And they may never speak to each other again. Because mine, the pattern of this world, not uncommon at all. If somebody were to tell you that, I'd be like, I'm, I'm not shocked at all. Happens all the time. Pattern of this world. How about another one? What about pleasure? Just seeking pleasure. Pleasure is like the priority, man. As long as it makes you happy, I mean, all you got to do is watch commercials. You can kind of tell that's the pattern of this world, right? It's all about pleasure. Physical pleasure. Doesn't matter if anybody gets hurt. It's what I want to experience in some kind of pleasure and popularity. How about here's another pattern of this world. Stuff is more important than people, right? We all know that. The pattern of this world. Stuff is more important than people. It is the pattern of this world. How about I add on to that one? What about being right or winning is more important than people? Is it not? In this world, if you're right, it doesn't matter if it hurts people. I was right, by golly. It doesn't matter who gets hurt. It is the pattern of this world. And then what about this one? You can hate and dislike persons you don't even know. Never met them. Know nothing about them. Based on what someone told me and what I heard, I already don't like you. Don't even need to meet you. Don't need to hear your side of the story. Don't need to know anything from you. I already have made up my mind. I don't like you. Now, if I'm even slightly correct <laughs> that those things, and that's certainly not a conclusive list, but that those things represent the pattern of this world, then it does beg the question, why would God want us to be different? Why would God want his people to not look like and not live according to the pattern of this world? Let me let you in on a little secret. So the world may know who God is. That is always why God has chosen a people to work through. Be it Abraham and the Jewish people and be it the church today, his people are always for the purpose of so people will come to know who he is. Because God wants to be glorified and he wants us to enjoy relationship with him. 
That cannot happen if we live according to the pattern of this world. Because what that means is simply we're pretending to have a relationship with God, but we're lacking the very power of his spirit that actually calls forth the new creation. And the best we can do is try to fool some people on a Sunday morning. It's not unless and until the spirit of God is truly changing us. Stay with me here. When Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, you need to know the Greek word there is metamorpho. Metamorpho. We get our word metamorphosis from that. Meta means change, right? Morpho, form. Change, form. And God has provided for us an incredible example of this in the butterfly. Any of you ever studied the butterfly? You probably remember from school, the caterpillar. When I ordered these, I thought they'd be bigger, you know. Just. <laughs> the caterpillar and the butterfly. Yeah, we got some up on the screen there, I think. Do we not? There we go. And you see the caterpillar and how it goes to the branch. I'm telling you, folks, don't miss. There's a sermon on the screen for you right there if you just can hear God speaking. This phenomenon of the butterfly coming from the caterpillar is, I'm telling you, if you want to just do a study this week, just delve into it. There's a real question even. Does the caterpillar die? You, you can find scientific arguments on both sides. Some people say, well, yes, the caterpillar dies, and it becomes as if a different species. And then others, no, 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 it turns into like a gooey soup, but it doesn't die. Some of the DNA of the caterpillar gets carried on into the butterfly. Oh, it's fascinating to hear science debate the miracle of God that he placed right in creation. He said, you want to know what a living sacrifice looks like? You want to know what it looks like to become a new creation in Christ? Well, you start out like a caterpillar. And if we could have that picture up one more time. And you attach yourself to the branch. I'm reminded of the teaching about Christ, the vine, the branches. Oh, I think there's a sermon in there somewhere. And you attach yourself and you begin to receive a change, a cocoon forms around you. And it's almost like there's some miracle trying to understand what happens inside that cocoon. What we do know is at some point, a caterpillar emerges. A butterfly emerges. Like I said, right? No. <laughs> and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And when Paul says to us, be transformed, be metamorphosed by the renewing of your mind, Allowing the Word of God to renew your mind. Some of you probably was wondering what this thing was. This is a reminder. I changed my air filter out yesterday, and it's kind of dirty. <laughs> so when you think about renewing your mind, friends, can I tell you, if you think the valley has dust and you need to change your air filter, you need to know that the world has tons and tons of dirt that's going to get in your mind and going to cloud the way you think. You need to renew your mind. You need to be intentional about cleaning out the air filter so you can hear from God and know that God is speaking to you. I love how in John 14, Jesus taught, all this I have spoken, he said to his disciples, all this I've spoken to you while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said. How many of you got a reminder from God this past week? 
I, I hope you did. I hope there was something you were doing and going through your week, and all of a sudden God reminded you of something. He brought a scripture to mind. If that's not happening in your life, then maybe you need to change the filter and get into the Word a little bit so that God can, through the power of His Spirit, bring to mind, remind you of something. When you get ready to act out of selfishness or you get ready to do something that, that is according to the pattern of this world. I uh, drove up to, to Modesto this past week for a service and um, was driving down the 99. Anybody been on the 99 lately from uh, Modesto to here? You can get worldly. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you. Uh, you can both see the world and you can be tempted to be like the world uh, driving the 99. And sometimes you need God to bring to your mind, remind you of something he has said to you. I want you to take just a moment. I want you to think about a situation you're dealing with right now, maybe in your family, in your workplace, in your neighborhood. I'm going to give you just a couple seconds to be still and experience God. What is it God wants to remind you of that maybe you had forgotten about out there? Just, just let him remind you of something in here. In his presence, in this place, what does his spirit want to remind you of? For some of you, it may mean just being reminded that God loves you. He's not given up on you. For others, it might be he wants to remind you that what he began in you, he will bring to completion. And he's not finished with you yet. For others, maybe he just wants to remind you that that person is more important than that problem. And that leads us to the final point. If we're going to glorify God, which is our primary purpose, it's, it is about becoming a living sacrifice. That's very clear. It's God's will. His good, pleasing, and perfect will is that we become living sacrifices, that we be transformed, that we become something new. Think of the being transformed from the butterfly to the, I mean, from the caterpillar to the butterfly, and it doesn't happen overnight. It is a process. We need to trust God in the process that he who began a good work in us, he's going to bring it to completion. And it's about belonging to one another in the body of Christ. We talked about the body we talked about the mind. Now we're going to talk about the will. And in the American church, this may be one of the toughest aspects of being a living sacrifice. Paul says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you. I'm sorry, let me rephrase. I say to some of you, right? That's what he meant. He didn't mean all of us. I say to some of you. No, he said every one of you. Meaning every one of us, it applies as well. <coughs> Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Now, why would Paul need to say that? Why would he need to preface it that way? Because of this thing called pride. We can all begin to be puffed up and think we're more important than we really are. And I believe in Paul's day, in that context, he was speaking some to the Jewish people who probably looked down on the Gentiles and thought that we're more important, God loves us, we're more gifted, we're better, all the ways you would define that. And Paul levels the field by saying, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ... We, though many, form one body, and each what? <clears throat> Let's say that together. And each, 
That was pretty weak. Okay, let's try that one more time. And each. Okay, let's try it one more time. And each. That, my friends, is a hard one in the American church. We want to see ourselves as being individuals, not connected. I want to do my own thing in my own way. Got my own body I'm working on, my own ministry, my own. Not seeing that we belong to all the others. And I think one of the ways that the devil has been able to keep the church largely in America and probably worldwide, but certainly the American church, limited in what we're able to do is because we simply do not see ourselves as belonging to anyone else. I can do what I want to do. That's between me and God and should have nothing to do with anybody else. You have no right to question. Well, I'm just here to tell you that's not biblical. <laughs> we belong. And at some level, I think we recognize it. We know it. Because of how we end up as a body oftentimes struggling to recognize that people are more important than problems, that people are more important than stuff. Oh, we may have a hard time with learning and not living according to that pattern in our own families, but how much more so in the church family of recognizing what it means to belong. That Jesus broke down the dividing walls. I heard the story told, and I think it's so true as we think about belonging. As you know, the thief on the cross, <laughs> if you know the story of the thief on the cross, he, he cried out to Jesus, and Jesus said to him, today, you'll be with me in paradise. <laughs> and, uh, and if you just think and kind of fast forward down the road a little bit, and all of a sudden this thief, <laughs> he shows up in heaven, right? And he gets there, and they're like, what are you doing here? <laughs> and he's uh, like, I, I, I don't know. I, uh, this is where I was told to go. And they're like, well, uh, sure don't look like you belong here. I mean, you look like you're a thief. And I, uh, you know, I, well, I, I am. <laughs> I was actually dying for my crime when, uh, well, have you been baptized? Uh, no. <laughs> We're, you've not been baptized? What do you have that says you belong here? And, and, and I love this when he said, the guy on the middle cross <laughs> told me I could come. Isn't it true? We belong because Jesus said we belong. And I hope and pray today as we gather in this place, we can read this passage and we can think about how, well, in, in Paul's day, I'm sure there were some Gentiles and probably some Gentile women who had been told their whole life, you can't go there in the temple and you can't go any further. And, you, and all of a sudden, Walls have been broken down and they have access. And Paul's saying to them, you belong. You belong. You matter to God. And my prayer is that we will know what it is to glorify God as a church as we take steps to become living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. As we take steps to be transformed as we get into the word, let the word of God renew our minds and change the way we think and call forth that new creation. And as we recognize what it means to be a part of the family of God, may we love one another 
in ways that truly set us apart, holy and pleasing to God. And in our love for one another, not only will they know we are followers of Christ, but God will be glorified. Let's pray. God, I thank you. Thanks for watching our Tulare First Baptist YouTube channel. But don't stop here. Hit the subscribe button so you won't miss out on any of our future videos. Also, don't forget about the TFBC app where you can stay connected because we'd sure love to see you on a Sunday morning or at any of our events. May God bless you and have a great day.